What interests you about the conflict between good and evil? Well, the conflict between good and evil is the basic conflict. The universal question is, am I a good person? Um, I mean, not counting social misfits, of course, or... Um, People, the, people like you and me. Yeah. No, no I mean... Am I more, good, are you a good person? Uh, I try to be a good person. But, of course, that's a very complicated question. It is. And it's something you have to ponder because you're doing it every day. You're saying, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Now, through mythology and things, we're taught certain things that are good and certain things that are bad. But uh, a, a thinking person questions all that and say, is this really good? Am I really doing the right thing here? Am I really being a kind, compassionate person? Because to me, it's really about a compassionate person as opposed to a person that is consumed with self-interest or a selfish person. Those are the two things. Mm -hmm. We all have good and evil in us because we have the selfish side of us and we have the compassionate side of us. The idea is how do you keep those things in balance? And by keeping those things in balance, you can do a lot of good things. You're never going to get everybody's human. Everybody's greedy. When you become greedy, then you do bad things to get stuff from other people. Mm -hmm. Once you get that stuff, then you become afraid. Once you become afraid that somebody's going to take it from you, then you start striking out at people. And you start, you get angry at things. You get worried. And that puts you in a whole psychological mindset that makes you, turns you ultimately into an evil person. Where you're doing horrible things to people, thinking that you're doing the right thing. But you're doing it because you're afraid they're going to hurt you before you hurt them. How did Joseph Campbell affect your thinking when you were formulating the ideas? Joe Campbell was a comparative mythologist, and the Joseph Campbell angle really came out of my anthropology classes when I was in college. Yeah, I was very curious about the way societies work and why people do the things they do in a society, why they form their ideas, and I used to always think of mythology as a form of psychological archaeology. You're not just digging up pieces to look at them and try to figure out what is what's going on with the society. With mythology, you can actually understand the psychological underpinnings of what people actually were thinking, what they were afraid of, what they felt about their parents, what, you know, the, the, the real psychology of the whole thing. So that's what sort of started that whole process. And I had studied Joe Campbell. I continued to study Joe Campbell. And I really tried to take these psychological motifs from mythology all over the world. As a result, I was able to take ideas that go through all societies through all the ages, and bring them down and put them into a razzle-dazzle, Saturday matinee serial action-adventure film. And did you consciously think about, when you were making it, that you really wanted to make this a force for the good? Yes. Part of it is to bring back some of those old psychological motifs from mythology that I, part of it was I just wanted to see if they were still relevant. I knew they were, but you don't really know. A lot of it's turned into Freud and Jung, and, but you, you kind of know things are still working that way a little bit. But I didn't know how much. How much are just the basics of what are friends for? Why do you join together in a society to help each other? Your relationship to your father, your relationship to the generation that came before you that mm -hmm. seems to have screwed everything up. And how do you feel about passing that on to your kids? And how do your kids feel about the fact that you've been handed this mess from the earlier generation? You know, can you be stronger than your father in terms of the temptations that he was over, you know, the things he was maybe able to come over, overcome or not overcome. Maybe he's very successful, but still had a lot of flaws. Right. So there's a lot of complicated things that are put in there. You know, there are basic issues that you want to deal with. It's the same thing with the force, which is basically just a, an amalgamation of all religions and what all, you know, ever since the very beginning, it always comes down to this mysterious thing that we can't see that has some kind of power over us and or we have power over it or we go to it for help. It explains a lot of the things that, the mysteries, that we can't explain any other way. For my ally is the Force. And the powerful ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, 
even between the land and the ship. And you wanted to bring spiritual traditions together in a positive force. Yes, to say it's okay to believe whatever you believe. Organized religions have a place. But in the end, when they start saying things that are not positive and are not compassionate, they're not caring. You know, the Inquisitions and all, killing people in the name of God is wrong. There's just no question about it, because that's absolutely opposite of what all gods, shaman, everybody have taught us, which is God is love, not God is hate. So if you were going to put together, you know, the power of this influence that Star Wars has been in the world, right, and the kids that come up to you, they've come up to you in different cultures? Yes, all, any, all around the world. Do you have any stories about that? Any well, things you remember? One is just the look on their faces when they talk about where their voice goes, which is, you know, really inspired. Things, you know, we discovered early on with, with Star Wars because that was before videotape and everything. So we would get requests when the first Star Wars from hospitals. There would be a child who would be dying. And they'd say, can we see the movie? Because he's not going to last the week. Hmm. So we'd sh- show him the movie. And he would live for another six or nine months. <laughs> And it wasn't once that this happened. It happened hundreds of times. And you just sort of say, well, whatever we're giving them, whatever inspiration we give them, allows them to take the struggle further. Absolutely. And, you know, and maybe embrace the fact that it may not be that bad in the end. So what do you think in Star Wars helps them do that? Well, I just think the fact that, they, that there is good in the world and that there's kindness in the world and that they can... Uh, go on and, and laugh and enjoy themselves and that there is always change. So if it changes down, then they will change back up again. They won't, it's not a, life is not a constant. So you're not just going downhill or you're not just going uphill. And maybe they feel the force within them. And, and one might say that there's a continuity. So the child begins to think, well, maybe there's something beyond. Right. Well, that's, you know, conceptually when you get into the forest and you get into the living forest and the Uber force, which is basically, well, however you want to call it, heaven or born again or however you want to, you know, in terms of karma, that there is a continuum and that you join the, the force uh, when you die and you lose your personality, but you become one with this bigger living entity. If you look at Star Wars, you know, there are different kinds of myth. There's a heroic myth. There's a democratic myth. There's religious myth. There's economic myth. Where would you put Star Wars in the context of those mythic traditions? Well, it's the hero's myth, really. I mean, it, there's a whole political side to it, which is the same as the mythological side of it, which is where you take one of the issues was is how does a democracy turn itself into a dictatorship, which I was fascinated with. It happened in Rome, it happened in France, it happened in Germany. And what causes that to happen. So that was the political side of things. Even the myth- mythological side was more psychological. It was more on the personal side of sure. relationships and how people were doing things. Yeah, we had the head of the Stanford School of Design on, David Kelly. We talked about creativity. And he was saying that uh, you're creative till you're about the fourth grade, and then it pushes you into a channel. And so the key to be creative is to find the child that you were. Well, the thing is, being creative basically means, and have an imagination, it means you don't work inside the box. You don't like the being in the box. When did you realize you were outside the box? Pretty early on. That's why I didn't do well in school. How did you learn to trust your outside the boxness? Well, I didn't really trust it until I got into film school and I realized that I could do something that I could do that nobody else could do. So suddenly I was like, the best of everybody there. And it's because the way I was thinking was normally not the way other people thought. And, and I could see very clearly that the ones that were trying to follow the box, the ones that were trying to put tab A into tab B, and that's kind of, they weren't going to ever go anywhere. You know, you had to say, that doesn't work, guys. It's, look, if you work inside the box, you'll never win the game. That's where politics come in, because politics is a big box. So you found yourself... Uh, <laughs> And you get we're squashed, gonna, gonna and you get squashed if you not, go outside the box. We're not going to go right now. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you, 
you've had this tremendous success, therefore, and you've had tremendous success in film, and therefore you are a, quote, celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a burden in and of itself. But you are also someone with a deep emotional commitment to your craft and to making the good prevail. And when you go to sleep at night and you realize you've accomplished so much in terms of the Star Wars and the metaphors and the mythic dimensions to it and the force for the good and so forth. How do you feel? Put the other stuff aside, the negative aspects. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, obviously I feel good. When I have kids and people come up and, you know, are shaking and want to say, you know, you changed my life, you feel good about that. No matter, no matter how many sort of intellectuals or whatever say you're, you know, an idiot, you know that you've had an effect. And when I sit in a movie and I watch people react, I know it works. And that's all I need to know. Is I know I've, I've, I've taken somebody on a trip that is going to make them a more interesting person. And that's all I do. I don't think of it any grand picture. You know, it's, sure. uh, most of the people in the silent era movies are forgotten. And I assume that we will all be forgotten. But I have, while I was here, I tried to live a good life. I tried to do the right thing. I tried to make this a better world. And, uh, you know, people disagree about what's a better world and all that kind of stuff. And I feel that my picture of a better world is as accurate as any. I do, even though I make the movies about it, it's, the world to me is split into two halves. You know, the, the selfish part and the giving, compassionate part. And we're all struggling with both of them. And I know a lot of people that are thinking they're doing good, but they're selfish. And all they're doing is making the world a worse place. Well, but you've struck a very powerful blow for the good. There's no question about that. Well, if I'd have really made a difference, we wouldn't be sitting where we are today with this country in the mess that it's in. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that where you've made the difference is in the hearts of people yeah, and but... encourage them to be their true selves. And recognize their commonality. Not everybody saw Star Wars. Millions and millions I know and that. millions I know saw that. Star Wars. But I hope maybe people, there are plenty of people who should have seen Star Wars. I, I, I only hope that those who have seen Star Wars recognize the Emperor when they see him. Yeah, you know what you, <laughs> you, know what you, you ought to do? You ought to, you ought to make your list of the 100 people that should see Star Wars and send them each and say, just watch this movie. Yeah, but the, the, the evil people don't. You know, the emperors don't see it. No matter how much you tell them, they can't see beyond their own greed. And anybody who's talking about hate or, you know, putting doing bad things to people, they're on the emperor's side. They're, and it's, it's not hard to see people doing that. You say, that isn't right. You shouldn't be saying bad things about people. That's not helping anybody. But you're on the forces side. Well, I'm on the side that says you should treat people decently. And that, yeah, you can argue about whatever you want to argue about, but we're all in this boat together. Everybody's in it together. And we're going to all sink or swim together. And we haven't been doing a very good job over the last 10,000 years. All of my movies are about one thing, which is the fact that the only prison you're in is the prison of your mind. And if you decide to open the door and get out, you can. There's nothing stopping you. There it is. George Lucas. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.